Hey there everybody. Thanks so much for watching my channel. My name is Tara Pulaski and I'm a graduate assistant at Eastern Kentucky University in Richmond, Kentucky. But I'm currently broadcasting from here in good old Lexington. So this upcoming video series is part of a project for my English 750 class, which is topics and textual criticism, information, literacy, and revolution across the 14th century. So I'm super excited for this course because I love older literature, and this is just right up my alley. So for our first video, I'm going to discuss The Golden Legend by Jacobus de Voragen, which is a collection of the lives of Christian saints based on a Roman Catholic liturgies. So now, this was particularly interesting to me because I was baptized Greek Orthodox. My maiden name is Kaptenakis, so that explains that. But anyway, Greek Orthodox is a subset of Eastern Orthodox that overlaps quite a bit with Catholicism. When I was baptized, my grandfather gave me this plaque of St. George and the Dragon, and that story is even detailed in the Golden Legend, so that's a very cool connection. And I uh, do have my copy of the Golden Legend right here too. So. Even though the Golden Legend was written centuries ago, the impact on European and English culture was, is, enduring. The collection, which was written approximately in 1259 to 1266, has been shared as a manuscript as well as printed in just multiple editions. And since, you know, it's now been enduring on for 750 years, it's safe to say that this is still an interest in orthodoxy and saints in the Western world. So, on to my specific topic for today. In the Golden Legend, the majority of the saints that I read about embodied lives of poverty and material minimalism, believing that being poor was closer to Christ. In fact, several saints even wished that they had less than they currently did to obtain that like Christ-like Christ -like lifestyle. St. Elizabeth, as one example, was of the highest nobility, but she yearned for nothing more than poverty. Um, wanting to really embrace that lifestyle. Another example that I found was Saint Germain, a bishop that was born to a noble family, but instead chose to live like a really extremely minimalistic lifestyle that severely denied any pleasures in life. And here's a quote from his tale, just so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. So, from the golden legend was Saint Germain. He was always fasting and never ate anything until the evening. When he did eat, he would for first force himself to swallow ashes, and then make do with a barley loaf. Summer and winter he wore no more than a hair shirt and cowl to cover his head, and if he did not give them away, he would wear these garments until they fell apart. He sprinkled ashes on his bed. His only bedclothes were a hair shirt and a sack, and he had no pillows to lay his head on. So. I shared that particular quote to kind of give you an idea of the self-denial that many of these saints practices, practiced. Additionally, in the life of Saint Germain, he raised a generous swineherd to, swineherd to king, and ever since that happened, the descendants of the swineherd have ruled over the British nation since then. So since Saint Germain would raise this commoner to king, that implied to me that being a king and having that kind of lifestyle wasn't a sin. Otherwise, why would Saint Germain uh, give that position to somebody that helped him? Especially, you know, why would he want someone that helped him to be further away from Christ and further away from heaven? So this seems to imply that adhering to a poverty lifestyle might not be necessary since this person that was in poverty did a good deed and was rewarded with uh, being of the royal class. And to kind of further explore this, um, another saint, Saint Francis, also decided to embrace poverty and tread on a path of holy simplicity, opposed to living a more lavish lifestyle that he could have. And his tale even started with the, the, the sentence, Francis loved poverty, both in himself and in others, so much that he always referred to his lady poverty. And then one day St. Francis saw a man that was poorer than him and stated, This man's need puts us to shame. It's a scathing criticism of our own poverty, end quote, as if poverty was some kind of contest versus, you know, what it actually is, which is an enduring hardship for many of these people. Most of those poor people would pick not to be in poverty if they could, 
is evident by them taking comfort in stories such as St. Germain, where a common person can be raised and stationed to that of nobility. It seems that these saints really just wanted unnecessary hardships to try to maybe prove or show their holiness. For I consulted the actual Bible, and it doesn't really mention embracing a near masochistic lifestyle self-punishment with hair shirts and whippings and floggings and fastings and wearing uncomfortable clothes and not having wine as kind of described in the lives of the saints but I did find some quotes from the Bible that uh, speak to poverty so Proverbs, Proverbs says whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have Proverbs also says, the generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. And also in Luke, it states, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So scripture repeatedly states that people should indeed help and provide for the poor and be generous opposed to hoarding your wealth, but it doesn't say that state that you should just go out and become as poor as humanly possible yourself, as it seems like these saints did. When I was reading the stories, it seemed counter it seemed kind of counterintuitive to me, because if someone was wealthy or had a higher position in society, they might be able to use that power and wealth and influence to better help the poor than simply becoming poor themselves. Of course, for saints that were women. This could get a little more tricky with their with the oppressive and patriarchal society that they lived in because even if they kept their noble positions they may or may not have had much influence or agency but additionally when i was reading the golden legend i wondered how the poor themselves would receive these stories is the idea that wealthy noble and even royal members of society could simply give up their privilege by becoming poor is that an insult or would those in poverty view that as holy? If people are truly suffering in poverty due to class, society at the time, hardships, and illness, wouldn't they be skeptical of people that would willingly choose that poverty lifestyle? Why do the saints have to suffer so much to get into heaven, whereas others can have an easier lifestyle and still go to heaven? It kind of makes me think of if a progressive CEO or like hipster dude decided to live a minimalistic lifestyle and then claim they were holy because of their poverty, when in reality it was a choice they made despite their privileged backgrounds, opposed to a lifetime of hardships that someone in poverty can't escape. For me that's the difference. Some people don't have a choice and they're stuck being poor. These saints however did have a choice. So for me I viewed them kind of imposters uh, that made this, you know, poverty claim so that they could be more pious. To me, it just seems like another form of like masochistic self-punishment. And overall, you know, I don't really like this culture of just denial. So I also found it particularly ironic that the first printed edition of the Golden Legend England, which was printed by William Caxton in 1483, was especially extravagant as it was described as a folio edition with grand ambitions, one column woodcuts, 50 fine lines of text with generous margins, and the largest edition produced. So I found this ironic because it is an elaborate and expensive version of a book that teaches Christ's life poverty and minimalism. In this edition, which was funded by William Fitz Allen, who was the ninth Earl of Arundel, surely he was a man that uh, didn't embrace, embrace giving away all his earthly possessions, such as the saints. Though, upon further investigation, this earl did promise to not only buy a certain number of the finished books from Caxton, but also to give him two deer a year for the remainder of his life. So that's interesting. But, since the earl was willing to go such lengths just to have this extravagant version of the golden legend, it's really proof that the text did really endure and survive on after all these years. I mean, even today, students are learning about this book across the country and beyond, probably all over the world. So, all right, that's all I have for you today about the Golden Legend. But I appreciate you watching, and I'll catch you next time.